Bien, bueno, me sumo al, al saludo de Pablo, un eh, gran y cordial saludo de parte mía, mi nombre para los que no me conocen es Mariano Espléndido, soy doctor en Historia y bueno, esta nueva edición de la Jornada de Estudios Patrísticos me encontró como coorganizador eh, junto con Pablo, estos últimos dos años prácticamente hemos trabajado eh, codo a codo y realmente mucho con esta iniciativa hecha con mucho cariño y mucha apertura. Eh, bueno, no voy a repetir lo, lo que Pablo planteó respecto del espíritu de las jornadas, de, de hacer interactuar eh, bajo una temática común y, y realmente convocante, como es este caso, en este caso particular, la cuestión de lo femenino en los padres de la Iglesia, tanto a eh, investigadores e investigadoras consagrados, como también a aquellos que están llevando adelante... Eh, sus tareas de investigación en esta temática, eh, bueno, en diferentes etapas eh, justamente de su formación. Así que es un enorme placer recibirlos a todos, eh, hablantes de habla eh, castellana, y ahora también a nuestro público que eh, va a participar en inglés. Eh, simplemente algunas indicaciones, ¿sí? amén de que obviamente eh, siempre hacemos la misma invitación a que las... Eh, todas las redes de la biblioteca y los recursos que la biblioteca propone, la biblioteca de la Orden de San Agustín en Buenos Aires, están a disponibilidad para las respectivas investigaciones, eh, propuestas para continuar con nuestra tarea de, de extensión eh, académica y cultural, obviamente eso muchos de ustedes ya lo conocen y lo utilizan, también eh, avisarles que las conferencias van a ser grabadas y que posteriormente, cuando tengamos todas las autorizaciones correspondientes de los conferencistas, serán subidas al canal de YouTube, eh, y lo mismo con los textos y las publicaciones posteriores en las revistas de la eh, biblioteca. Eh, cualquier cuestión técnica, esto digamos, también es, es necesario aclararlo, que se nos corte la conexión por cualquier problema, eh, les pedimos que no desesperen y que se reconecten al mismo link que... Eh, que fue el que recibieron, ¿sí? eh, cualquier otro inconveniente se les comunicará eh, vía mail o haremos alguna comunicación. Pero eh, confiamos en que no vamos a tener ese tipo de inconveniente. Eh, bien, les pedimos por favor que mantengan durante las conferencias y las sesiones los micrófonos cerrados, ¿sí? eh, respetemos los tiempos, todos los que son expositores, así podemos hacer un desarrollo lo más ameno posible, y eh, bueno, tendremos los cortes eh, tal como están marcados en, en el programa. Cualquier otro, otra pregunta, a medida que van ocurriendo las, eh, las conferencias, pueden depositar sus comentarios, preguntas en el chat, para que los moderadores puedan transmitirlo a los conferencistas, claramente, o en el momento de las preguntas, habilitar el, el micrófono y eh, preguntar tranquilamente. ¿Sí? Bien, eh, ahora vamos a dar la bienvenida a todos los participantes en eh, eh, lengua inglesa, que tenemos varios también y que nos honra eh, realmente mucho. So, good morning, uh, on behalf of the Library of the Order of San Augustine, uh, we welcome all English language participants to the 7th Congress of Patristic Studies this year, based on the theme, Woman, Why Do You Weep? Images and Readings of the Feminine in the Patristic Literature. The Augustinian Library of Buenos Aires promoted this event many years ago, from 2009, as a space for exchange and training for open dialogue in a humanistic key. We ask you, no, please uh, keep the microphones off and turn your questions to the chat so that the moderators can share them with the exhibitors. Uh, If the connection uh, is lost or internet drops for any reason, uh, we ask you uh, to re-enter the meeting with the same link. Uh, do not despair, these things uh, can happen in virtuality. We remind you that the readings of the session will be available uh, on the YouTube channel of the Augustinian Library of Buenos Aires, uh, and that the works uh, will also be uh, every uh, Papers will also be published in the library streams. So we will begin the first conference of this uh, first day of uh, our meeting uh, with Dr. Paul Van Gist, uh, who will open the fire here. Uh, 
with uh, his presentation. I will make a very brief introduction of him in Spanish. Most of people, uh, uh, participants in English know him. Uh, so I will make the, his presentation for our uh, Spanish uh, participants. Bien, vamos a presentar al doctor Paul Van Gist, que va a dar nuestra primera conferencia del día. Eh, el doctor Paul Van Gist es profesor titular de Economía y Teología de la Universidad de Erasmus de Rotterdam, profesor titular de Historia de la Iglesia e Historia de la Teología en la Universidad de Tilburg y profesor invitado en la Facultad de Teología y Estudios Religiosos de la Universidad Católica de Leuven. Entre bueno, sus numerosas publicaciones, tenemos gran cantidad de material referido a San Agustín y a otros padres, así que les recomiendo que recurran a su perfil para poder eh, acceder a estos trabajos, muchos en colaboración, algunos volúmenes colectivos con otros autores, así que es un gran honor tenerlo a Paul presente entre nosotros, eh, que, que haya eh, enviado su colaboración tan generosa a, este, a estas jornadas, eh, y lo vamos a escuchar muy atentamente. So, Paul, uh, all the space is yours. You can share the, the screen uh, and with you. Lamentablemente no hablo español, pero entendí lo que dijo Mariano y Pablo. Ma voy a mejor mejorar mi vida y aprender el español <laughs> un giorno. Pero por ahora voy a a enseñar in English, uh, <laughs> if it's possible. Well, this was very bad Spanish, but just wanted you know that I, I, will, I will really uh, take some effort to learn Spanish because I did learn Italian in the time I was a student in Rome, but it would have been much better to study in Spain because, well, the Spanish la uh, uh, language is much more used worldwide than Italian. On the other hand, uh, it's the way it is. I will continue my lecture in uh, in English in the awareness that some of you I already know because Patricia, for instance, she's my boss in the patristic uh, uh, the Institut d'Etude Patristique. So I, uh, this is a <laughs> <laughs> No, but really, uh, I'm, I'm a boss. <laughs> Anyhow, Augustine's view on of women had a profound effect on the developing Christian church. His prodigious influence on the history of the Christian church can be discerned in both Catholicism and Protestantism. And it was from Augustine more than any other theologian that medieval thought took its theological framework of ideas. And last week I uh, had to give an guest lecture at the Faculty of Psychology in Nijmegen. And one of the sources they use to introduce the students in the power of the memory is, as you probably will know, Augustine. So he's still, even after the Enlightenment, he's everywhere, even in the secularized West. Now, as a result, his view of women had a profound effect on the developments in the Christian church. And Augustine is often blamed for his attitude toward women. It was noted, for instance, that although Genesis affirms the natural correspondence by creation of women and men, in Genesis it was written, Ezer Kenecto, a helper corresponding to, Augustine's exegesis of 1 Corinthians 11, 7b, for he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man, denies the image of God to women by creation. And the emphasis is placed rather on the manner in which Eve was meant to be a helper of Adam. And in his literal commentary on Genesis, The woman is found, figuratively speaking, walking behind the man, barefoot and pregnant. And Augustine's reason, reasons for that purpose of either companionship or assistance in physical labor 
another man would have been a more suitable helper than a woman. And he concludes in his literal commentary on Genesis, if it were not the case that the woman was created to be a man's helper specifically for the production of children, then why would she have been created as helper, as Genesis states? I cannot think of any reason for, for a woman's being made as a man's helper if we dismiss the reason of procreation. So this is Augustine. Of course, it was also noted that any critical discussion of Augustine's attitude toward women as derived from his discursive texts must take into account the nature of his philosophical and social milieu as its predominant uh, and its predominant view of women. In his days, a utilitarian view of women was common to pagan culture as evidenced by the distinctions made by Greek men who assigned women class divisions on the basis of social function. And this in scholarly literature on Augustine and his view on marriage was meant to be a kind of an excuse. Now, in my lecture, it is my aim to demonstrate that Augustine held more than a simply utilitarian view of womankind, especially in the light of his time, it is remarkable that insights put forward by Augustine in his work were actually diametrically opposed to the insight he puts forward in his literal commentary on Genesis. And in doing so, as a matter of fact, I'm also pointing out an inconsistency in his thinking about women. Or perhaps I should put it another way, as he gets older, his thinking about women becomes more nuanced. He wrote his literal commentary on Genesis around 401, and the treatise uh, with which I'm going to deal with in my lecture, De Adulterinis Conjugiis, um, he wrote that treatise in 419, 420. And a third option is that Augustine, as an, well, let's say an occasional writer, allowed his views on women to be influenced by the concrete occasion for which he has to deliver a treatise or a homily. I will not discuss these three options any further because it would enlarge my lecture considerably. The fact is, however, that in De Adulterinis Conjugiis, Augustine develops a vision on women, which in a certain sense is at odds with the image in his literal commentary on Genesis. First, a bit of history. In 401, Augustine wrote his De Bono Conjugali, and he wanted to take, as you probably know, a middle position between the views of Jovinian and Hieronymus. Before 389, Jovinian, who was a secularized monk, had suggested that the life of consecrated virgins or male religious in whose state abstinence was prescribed was no more meritorious than that of married people. In baptism, everyone's equality was established. A choice for an ascetic way of life did not change this at all. Hieronymus, who was living with his widows, as you probably know, in Bethlehem, he was surrounded by uh, widows. He had reacted furiously to Jovinian already in 393. He characterized uh, Hieronymus marriage as vomit to which no widow would want to return, all the more so because this state of life was said to have originated only after the fall. And Paul's word that the woman will be saved by her motherhood if she persists in 
sophrosune, piety, wisdom, he interpreted as a command to bring children to consecrated virginity. Yes, Hieronymus, he was a kind of a hardliner <laughs> in a way. Strongly opposing to Hieronymus' rigid aversion to all things physical and fearing to be called a Manichaean yet again, Augustine wrote De Bono Conjugali. And he wrote that childbearing was certainly not the sad consequence of the fall, but belonged to man's originally established state. So he undermined the position of Hieronymus. But he undermined also Jovinian's point of view by identifying marriage as a good, although he emphasized also virginity as a higher good. This ambivalence in Augustine's marriage ethics was, in my opinion, the basis for a view of marriage that was unique for his time. Above all, he emphasized that in marriage, men and women are equal allies. Thus, he describes marriage as a friendly and fraternal bond, an amicalis quedam et germana conjunctio in de bono conjugali. Marriage is good because it honorably produces children and edifies parents because partners release the elevating and purifying power of love in each other. That's the bonum prolis. Th through and they ele uh, in marriage, they purify the power of lo love also uh, along the way through mutual fidelity, bonum fidei. And because by extension, it reflects the bond between Christ and his church, a marriage also is represented as the bonum sacramenti. And underlying his conception of the bonum prolis is undoubtedly his aversion to the Manichaeans and to Hieronymus. But when he considers the bonum prolis and the bonum fidei together, he appears to want to elaborate marriage primarily as an alliance between man and woman on a perfect equal basis. So he says that the bonum prolis represents the first phase in marriage in which young spouses regulate their passion. Uh, marriage as a remedium concupiscentiae. I, I don't think in Holland, if I'm going to elaborate on that in my research, they will be very happy. But on the other hand, <laughs> it is an interesting thought. Uh, well, uh, the bottom <laughs> point, uh, it goes hand in hand with the desire, and therefore it's a bonum, it goes hand in hand with the desire for the responsibility of parenthood. And the bonum fidei, in a further stage of, the, of the developing the marriage on an equal basis, then represents the phase in which the fire of passion has led to a bond of accommodation and above all of mutual loyalty which is based on and expresses itself in the in exclusive right to each, other bo each other's bodies. But it's above all a good of the spirit. And if after, let's say, the passionate period, partners are forced to abstain by illness or old age, or if they both choose to turn to God through abs abstinence, their marriage, in the face of the bonum fidei, therefore, their marriage is at least as valuable as before. And in his suggestion to the elderly to abstain from sexual intercourse when their limbs 
are weakening, Augustine says, when their limbs are weakening. I'm not sure when that's going to happen. <laughs> and neither he is very explicit on that. Augustine echoes not only his view of humankind, but also the idea that human development is ideally directed towards strengthening the spiritual bond between a man and a woman on an equal basis, which is simply more intimate than, or can be simply more in intimate than the physical. But the physical bond is assumed. Abstinent is not decent, let alone a higher good, if only one of the partners pursues this virtue for the sake of individual self-perfection. His passages on this subject breathe an atmosphere of equality. Nor the man nor the woman is allowed to uh, live a life in abstinence if one of the partners doesn't want to do so. Already between 397 and 401, Augustine formulated a view of friendship and community in marriage that was unique for his time because equivalence and friendship, that is what he emphasizes in De Bono Coniugali. And that's not all. A later work, which has remained rather underexposed, is De Adulterinis Coniugis. It has mainly served as a source for studies on divorce in the time of the church fathers in early Christianity. Yet the work contains surprising new insights on marriage and shows once again that Augustine's main concern was to emphasize not only the equality of man and woman, but also the moral superiority of women. The occasion for the writing of this book were the ideas of a certain Polensius, probably, an, we don't know much about him, he was probably an educated North African layman. And on the basis of 1 Corinthians 7, 10, 11, he had suggested that one, a woman may not remarry if she has left without committing adultery, but two, a person who was sent, has sent away her partner uh, or his partner because of his adultery may remarry without being accused of adultery. And he emphasized these opinions on the basis of 1 Corinthians 7, in which is uh, 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 7, 10 to 11, in which it was written. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. So this was the basis for the interpretation of Polensis, and it would, go, it would be going too far to discuss Augustine's sometimes very complex objections in detail here. He goes on and on and on. But I will only note that Augustine emphatically rejects the first idea. Only adultery is the only valid reason for separation. Otherwise, one person could live in abstinence without the consent of the other. Whether or not there is adultery, physical or mental. And in marriage, he says, the bond of community takes precedent over the desire for individual asceticism and self-perfection. And there has to be equality between men and women in this respect. And Polensius' second idea angered Augustine because it would often be at the expense of the women. And his conviction that men and women have the same rights as married uh, uh, in, in marriage is palpable in the blistering putade following Polensius' idea. 
And in the second book of the Conjugiis Adulterinis, Augustine takes the opportunity to elaborate a theology of forgiveness in the context of his thinking about marriage as a form of communal life on a equal basis. And once again, it becomes clear that Augustine in the Conjugiis Adulterinis does not unconditionally consider abstinence in marriage to be a higher good. The bond of community takes precedence. The pursuit of a higher good by one person may never, as I said before, without consent of the other, lead to the breakdown of the marriage. He says, and I quote, we must be we must be very careful not to, under the cover of abstinence, abstinence, throw Christian marriage into disarray and, contrary to the Lord's most merciful decree, to drive into adultery men incapable of abstinence, who have been sent away by their wives who wish to live in abstinence. And likewise, women who have been sent away by their husbands for the same reason. So they're not allowed uh, to send their husbands away because they want to live in abstinence. There even seems to be an inconsistency in his thinking when Augustine recommends abstinence to those who are unable to forgive each other after, let's say, a calamity. He says, and I quote, if all things considered, we contemplate with faith and humility that everything in common between man and woman, common to human destiny, to evil, to danger, to injury, and common to salvation, then reconciliation between two spouses, even after adultery has been committed, but also after receiving cleansing from this sin, will not be shameful nor difficult. But yes, I know out of experience as a bishop, this unfortunately will not happen. So, on the other hand, Augustine tries to bring about forgiveness by fostering a sense of their equality in destiny uh, between uh, men and women. They are equal. They share the same fate. And that's what should bring about forgiveness in his view. And on the other hand, his insight gained, I think, in pastoral practice because he was a bishop, resonates that forgiveness is the prelude to the restoration of the marital community on this equal basis of men and women. But he also emphasizes that kind of cynic, this is a virtue that is difficult to put into practice. And even more so. As the second book progresses, Augustine appears to attribute to the man, especially the man, the inability to forgive. For man, it's very difficult to put into practice the virtue of forgiveness. He says and repeats all the time. And it has to do with his sense of superiority, which, nourished by social opinions, is particularly evident in the different standards they apply to judge their own moral behavior and that of their lives, respectively. All the more. So since he takes the scriptures, the scripture passage that the man is the head of the woman, Ephesians 5, verse 23, as an appeal to men to be examples of honesty and faithfulness in marriage bond, Augustine is furious about, well, the different standards, especially men tend to apply to judge their own moral behavior. 
they take another standard for their own moral behavior and they harsh they have a harsh judgment on the moral behavior of their wives and augustine is furious about this because he not interprets ephesians 523 as a sociological uh, uh feature no man is head of the women because of his fine example in social and moral life and because they have these different standards Augustine is furious about this and he says, and I quote, as if they, men, should not therefore overcome their lust because they are men with their superiority and yet they are indignant when they hear that adulterous men suffer the same punishment as adulterous women, whereas they should be punished all the more severely because it's more right for them to surpass women in virtue and to lead by their example. So Augustine's criticism of his gender peers can thus be traced to their double standards in morals and their pride, their haughtiness. And the latter also fills him with great concern. It keeps men insensitive to the power of forgiveness. And the Lord's forgiveness is granted to humankind and to men to the extent that we or he has made this virtue his own, according to Augustine. So you will be forgiven to the extent that you are practicing the virtue of forgiveness yourself. The blistering boutades, the blistering conferences betray Augustine's great irritation about the fact that many men, in his opinion, are still in a premature stage of their moral development. Women are better. Now I come to my very brief conclusion every word whether or not written in response to augustine's words in the controversy between hieronymus and jovinianus takes on its full meaning when it is understood as a further elaboration of marriage as a bond of friendship between equals the controversial views offered Augustine, the controversial views of Hieronymus and Jovinianus, offered Augustine the opportunity to enrich his idea rather than hindering its development of men and women as being married on an equal basis in this amicalis et germana conjunctio. And if one looks at Augustine's view on marriage from this point of his, from, from his point of view, that men and women are equal, then he appears to see unfaithfulness as an opportunity to acquire the virtue of forgiveness. And every self-image that hinders Christ's forgivingness has the opposite effect to healing and it is precisely in the context of marriage however that especially men should be convinced as quickly as possible that they need forgiveness and should be forgiving in this respect they still have we still have much more to learn from women in Augustine's view. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. We are really, we really thank your your exposition. Um, well, it's been really clear. Uh, but uh, we will share the space uh, to everyone who wants to participate. Abrimos el espacio para eh, consultas, preguntas.
eh, intervenciones, si quieren pueden escribirlo o pueden abrir el micrófono y participar. If you want, you can write in the chat or you can participate uh, with the microphone, uh, turn on. And Paul will answer. And I will try to understand. I, I will try. <laughs> yeah, if, if you talk slowly, I may be able to understand. It's, uh... Ok. Eh, 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 Paul entiende algo de español. Si alguien quiere preguntar en español y habla lento, eh, no hay problema. <laughs> sí. Si no lo traducimos. Bien, para empezar, then Paul, I will begin. Ah, Lena, yeah, yeah. Oh, you can talk. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Please. am I unmuted? Can yes. you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. I can hear right. you, Lena. I can okay. hear you. Okay, Paul, thank you so much for this wonderful um, lecture. It, it's also very surprising to hear that uh, a church father, you know, from 1600 years ago would have such a, um, a modern attitude. Let's, let's put it that way, and a very um, healthy attitude towards forgiveness, and, and their, uh, among other things. But I I'm, would like you to accentuate whether, um, because I'm studying the city of God and all the major works of Augustine, and I don't really see that attitude so um, strikingly. So you're based, your conference is based upon That one small text, I think, on adultery, if I uh, yeah, yeah. if I understand, stood uh, correctly. And my question is more: um, Did Agassiz go any further as to how you might install this this consciousness of forgiveness in men, or did he just leave it hanging? As a, yeah. a universal problem, which we're still dealing with after 1600 years. Yeah, well, That's this, my... is wonderful, this is a wonderful uh, uh, <laughs> Well, uh, Lila, thank you very much. Um, well, the thing is, and I, I gave you in the beginning of my lecture, I gave you this third option that Augustine, every treatise he wrote, almost every homily he held, he shows himself to be a occasional writer um, and I think that uh, in 420 the time that he wrote um, De Adulterinis Coiris as a reaction on the position of Polensius he developed his vision on women uh, yeah, being influenced by the concrete occasion and that makes that Augustine in a way and I don't blame him because it especially makes him a very interesting author, is in his thinking about men, in his thinking about women, very inconsistent, because one in one occasion he has to defend the position of a man in the social, sociological structure of the familia. And in another treatise like De Coniugis Alotrinis, he has to defend the position of women, which were sent, uh, sent away after committing condols, uh, adultery or presumed adultery because the men were very unforgiving and the way he wants to implement the way he wants to uh, interiorize uh, uh, in his audience this position of this virtue of um, faithfulness uh, uh, forgivingness uh, well he, he has some let's say rhetorical strategies lamenting, always insisting with the same question, why do you so, why do you do so, why are you so, it cannot be this way that you are so unforgiving. So he's always hammering uh, on the same point in the hope to, well, let's say, weaken the hearts of the unforgiving men, the unforgiving us. Yeah, it's not a very nice story to hear be, uh, if you're <laughs> being a man. more to tell, but it's true. We but forgive you. We forgive yeah, you. Oh, thank you. Oh, that, that, that's, that's, you set an example. That, you set an example. I hope my, my fellow men are forgiving as well, but no. But uh, the thing is, uh, 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 being a for occasional writer uh, and uh, being very aware of the difficulty of um, 
well, the situation of women being sent away after the presumed adoption, he defends them. And that's uh, why he uh, emphasizes vehemently that men, and especially almost only men, should interiorize this virtue of forgive forgiveness. And uh, the way by which he interiorizes, uh, uh, tries to interiorize this, this virtue of forgiveness in, um, uh, in manhood, so to speak, is by frappe toujours, by uh, 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 every time in, with the same rhetorical structure, the same syntax, insisting that they should be forgiving. And so he wants to, well, break down their uh, stubbornness in a matter, uh, as a matter of fact. May I make, Mariano, may I make a comment? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Well, that's interesting, but um, my lecture tomorrow, I'll be mentioning compassion. And I was wondering why that wasn't a, a sort of a, um, a kind of a departure point for Agassiz. No. This yeah. developing the sense because he emphasizes compassion, the importance of compassion in many works. Oh, but I, but but the oh, ears are closed, obviously, from that. Yeah, yeah. That I think that uh, uh, well, it's good that I I uh, had the, the first lecture and you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you no, the, you the, can the, get the, me the, tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but yeah. the ability to uh, be uh, to to to. to uh, well, to, to interiorize this, this habitus of forgiveness anticipates on the virtue of compassion, I think. And I think that because he is an occasional writer, he insists in this very specific, specific situation in which he uh, uh, tries to undermine the position of Polentius. I think that uh, given this special situation, he, has to, he, he found himself to insist on uh, on uh, the, the virtue of forgiveness. Uh, compassion would have been another story because the man he has uh, in his audience, I think in the time he wrote against Polentius, they did not have to be, they, they did not need to become uh, compassionate. They uh, had to become forgiving first. I think that that's mm. that was what yeah. that the, this, the virtue of forgiveness and the virtue of compassion. I agree totally and utterly with you that uh, this this uh, being compassionate uh, uh, is a uh, well a mandatory uh, characteristic for a married man and a married woman, but then on an equal basis and without the difficulties which are caused by uh, adultery or presumed adultery. That is another other story as a matter of fact yeah. but Bodo Koyugali I, I agree with you that he insists on being compassionate thank you thank you Paul oh, thank you for your question alguien que quiera participar eh, volcando su pregunta en el chat o abriendo el micrófono anyone else who wants to participate eh, Luisa I uh, will try to do it in English but if I forget some word, please help me. <laughs> no, no, just try, try. Paul will understand. Um, I was studying about the figure of Perpetua, uh, mm. the martyr, and I was reading about an uh, interesting lecture about uh, her confession because uh, this author, I forgot the name, uh, tried to say that the only situation that she was in front of the governor mm -hmm. and uh, declares I am a Christian was a uh, uh, political business. As mm. era un asunto de estado. Sí, I agree. And, y trasladó esta, este asunto privado de la creencia y de su fidelidad y de la iglesia mm -hmm. y lo mm -hmm. volcó en un asunto eh, público. Mm. So I I was wondering if eh, quizás en este en este movimiento de perdón o de igualdad o esta lectura 
moderna eh, que hace, se puede trasladar el perdón del de, eh, adulterio, también podría verse de alguna manera como un asunto político o de Estado en términos de eh, la Unión Europea. Yeah. Sí, yeah, I think this is a very uh, uh, interesting and provoking thought. I'm not sure. I should. Es un pensamiento bueno. But um, uh, I think that you have, you have that's a very profound thought. I should dig into this. I cannot say it because I um, I I, uh, I uh, focused on the analysis of forgiveness in the conjugis adulteries. But it might be. I think it's a very interesting approach you mentioned, Luisa, um, because it might be that forgiving as a unique part of Christians was uh, exemplified in not only the Passio Perpetua, but also in uh, later treatises, Augustine wrote on uh, De Bono, uh, De, Ad uh, de uh, Adulterinis Conjugiis. Uh, that, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, we, it's a very, uh, so I have no answer, but the, 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 the question is uh, provoking. It's a very provoking thought. Thank you. And I think, well, I, I'm uh, in my uh, on my hard disk. I'm uh, thinking, what 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 is in the, the the life of Cecilia and all these early? Maybe you are right. You are right that it was the selling point of the Christians being full of forgiveness. Like it was the selling point to construct hospitals and uh, houses for the old aged, not to give the people bread and uh, uh, play. Uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, pan, a, uh, pan, a, uh, bread and play the, in the like in the Colosseum. Circuses. Pan and circus. Pan and circus. Yeah. Pan and circus. Pan and circus. Pan and So, <laughs> but that was a selling point of the Christians. But it also can be that that was a sociological selling point. As a matter of fact, they attracted people to them because they had this option for the poor. But it also can be that um, emphasize. Uh, putting emphasis uh, emphasis on the uh, virtue of forgiveness, it, it, that it could have been spiritual uh, unique selling point of the Christians. I, I uh, thank you for this 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 wonderful uh, line of thinking. This question also. See you. <laughs> Gracias, Luisa. Thank you both. Uh, anyone else? We have time for another intervention. Por otra para otra intervención tenemos tiempo todavía. Si alguien quiere preguntarle, eh, hacer alguna sugerencia. Creo que alguien estaba abriendo el micrófono. No sé ah, si... ah, Patricia, I, perdón. I'm, I'm... Patricia. Oh, only, only to, to say hello. And, Hi, and I would like to say that it's an honor for us as uh, Argentinian scholars to have you in, in this important conference. And oh, well, and I would like to to say it, 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 your position about Augustine is very interesting because it's a very different perspective. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, that, that, that's right. You're absolutely right by uh, uh, saying this. Uh, it, it is an exceptional treatise, and uh, I'm not surprised that only women uh, dare to ask questions after this little lecture. <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> So thank you, women, for asking the question. <laughs> and I understand the silence of us men. Us men. <laughs> <laughs> bueno, eh, para ir cerrando, eh, Paul, if you, uh, I have just a, a remark about your, your presentation. Uh, and I think that this position that's, uh, that Augustine takes, no? an, an intermediate position between Jovinianus and the those who Jeronimus uh, says about no uh, the, the superiority of uh, virginity of celibacy and Augustine is uh, I how can I say it it's more human it's um, he he sees the social value of social bond uh, social bond no this is Absolutely. a question of friendship Absolutely. and yeah. this is you you can say it's what well, we can read it we can uh, understand it as a strategy with other bishops, contemporary of, of Augustine, uh, a strategy uh, in this world, uh, which is 
way to Christianization that it's, well, we should um, uh, strengthen the, the, the Christian family. So marriage Absolutely. really is. Yeah, yeah, that's a wonderful thought and a, a, a wonderful valorization of, uh, well, the analysis of the conjugis, uh, Alotrinis, I have just given. It's a wonderful uh, thought you uh, yeah. you brought up. Yeah, and there's, is there any, uh, outside the Christian world, no? in another contemporary of Augustine from the pagan uh, side, there's, there's, uh, there exists this idea of, uh, uh, amicitia between uh, woman and husband, uh, this uh, this relation uh, more than the question of uh, child childbirth or, or this. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I'm I'm not sure. It, it's a very good question, and I am. No, I'm not sure, but I intend to think that because of uh, well, in from our Christian point of view, very mm. hard. Uh, uh, Roman uh, canon law in which the part of Peers was allowed to uh, uh, say uh, 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 when a, a, a child was born, well, yeah. uh, it's up to me whether you can stay alive uh, or not. He had seven days to decide mm -hmm. on that. I'm intent or inclined to think that uh, because of the uh, also the, uh, the changements um, Christians made in canon law in the period of Constantine, uh, that uh, and that's also uh, well following up Hola. on the, Louisa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm inclined to think that uh, well, Christianity made. Uh, the relationship between men and women made relationship uh, relationships whatsoever between slaves and and, and master much more well uh, full of mercy a uh, Christian as a matter of fact um, that that's kind of a first uh, not pretty well articulated thought on this uh, question Mariano yeah I think that. Um, well, as a matter of fact, um, the way Christians dealt with all kinds of relationships between men and women, bosses and slaves, the position of the pater familias, which was a kind of an absolute despot in canon yeah. law, undermined. Yeah. Well, for thank you, thank you very much for the answer. For to receive uh, oh. all the proposals uh, and uh, to be really gentle and, and kind with all of us, uh, we are really happy to receive you. Estamos muy felices de, de haberte recibido, de oh, yeah. tenerte en este espacio. Sin duda, sin duda. To visit the land of the Pope, that will be my to dream. To visit the land of the Pope, that's right, that's right. The, the, the extreme south. <laughs> <laughs> you you have come to Argentina uh, in your life? No, any anyone? No, uh, any time? No. no. No, no. But I had an uncle who lived in Buenos Aires. Really, my ah. my my grandfather was married twice. So my father, but it's a personal story. Uh, oh. He had an an elder brother of the first marriage of my uh, grandfather, and he moved to um, Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina. Because he, um, well, he, he founded there a milk factory. And you know, all Dutch are farmers. Yeah. Cows, and he, he, he conducted a milk factory over there. And, yeah. But I've never, because uh, I never came to um, Argentine and he never came to Holland because he liked it. Yeah. He liked it much more better than in Holland. So here you go. <laughs> Amazing. No, no, it's incredible. So, well, for the for the eighth uh, conference on patristic studies, we, you you can you can come here. You will be, oh, wonderful. We will I would be love to. Very welcome. Very welcome. But I bring Lila with me because she is my. <laughs> of course. <laughs> in a way, she is <laughs> a kind of a companion. Not <laughs> <laughs> in marriage, but she is a companion. <laughs> patristic research in Holland. Yeah. Of course, of course. Bueno, serás muy bienvenido, Paul, Lela, a todos. Serán muy, muy bienvenidos. Sin duda, sin duda que sí. Sin duda que sí. Bueno, gracias, Paul. Thank you very much. Gracias. Uh, we will continue now with uh, 
Session 1, vamos a continuar con la sesión eh, primera, que va a estar a cargo del doctor Esteban Noche, que ya está presente, y creo que los expositores también, eh, así que vamos a... Eh, todos tienen la posibilidad de compartir ya, así que no, no hay ningún problema, vamos a eh, darle...